Monsieur d'Orsay copied the document to which I am referring from the order book of the second company of the third battalion of the second brigade of light French infantry. This book of orders found at Cairo after the departure of the French army was given to the Reverend Mr. Moore, who lent it to the Duke of Wellington by the son of General Moncrief. At the headquarters at Cairo, first Nivos year seven. Every day at noon on the squares opposite the hospitals will be played by the regimental band's various national airs, which inspire the sick with gaiety and recall to their memory the most beautiful morning of their past campaigns. The commanding officers will, in consequence, give orders that the bands of the various corps shall perform in turn of service. For the commander in chief, Alexandra Berthier, this mark of interest given to poor sick men, to unhappy wounded soldiers, sad and discouraged at the thought of their distant homes, reveals a delicate attention, a maternal solicitude, as Comte d'Orsay expressed it, and that provident goodness which was the basis of Napoleon's character. The partiality which the First Consul retained for his memorable Egyptian campaign was shown even in the taste which he had retained for the produce of that country. For a long time, his favorite dishes were pilau and dates. He had in his private gardens, both at La Malmaison and at saint Cloud, gazelles, which he had brought back from Egypt and which he loved to feed with his own hands. Sometimes he would offer them his snuff box. They were very fond of tobacco and would empty the snuff box in a minute without appearing any the worse for it. There were also for some time in the little park at St. Clou some mouflons which had been sent from Corsica. Their natural wildness was, however, such that it was impossible to keep them. Monsieur de Burienne, whom, as a matter of fact, I had succeeded, though not titularly so, had been Napoleon's schoolmate at the military school. They had commenced their military careers together, and Burienne had followed Napoleon to Italy and to Egypt. These associations, these habits, and the perfect tact of his conduct toward the First Consul had created him a position of confidence and intimacy which seemed destined to last forever. The first consul had appointed Burien counselor of state on special duty and had accorded to him rights and prerogatives which rendered him an important person of the state. He corresponded directly with the ministers on certain details of their service. Napoleon treated Burien with familiarity and often went out with him into the park of St. Clou, either in foot or in a buggy. Madame Burienne was almost independent and neither ate nor slept in the palace. He had just bought a charming house at St. Clou, had furnished it richly, and used to give dinners there to which the ministers, and particularly Fouché, the senators, councillors of state, and so on, were invited. His expenses and his purchases were out of proportion with the private fortune which the First Consul knew him to possess. Although their mutual relations did not appear changed, the first consul's vexation, which he still concealed from Burien, sometimes showed itself in things which he said in my presence. He seemed to me to have some private grievance against him, which he had not sufficiently investigated. The unfortunate affair of the brothers Coulon put a stop to this hesitation and was the drop which made the vase overflow. One Wednesday, being the day of the cabinet council, I was busy in the first consul's study when I saw him enter hurriedly. He asked me if Beren was in his office, and on my affirmative answer, he called him to the threshold of the door. Beren came somewhat troubled by the consul's excited appearance. The consul said to him in a severe tone of voice, Give any papers and keys which you have of mine to Meneval and withdraw, and never let me see you again. After these few words, he went back to the council, slamming the door violently behind him. 
Monsieur de Bourrienne, at first dumbfounded by this violent tirade, gave way to extreme despair. I did all I could to calm him. I tried to comfort him with hopes which I knew to be fallacious, for what hope could there be after a decision so laconically and so severely formulated? During the first two or three days which followed this painful scene, we exchanged some letters, but after that, all relations between us ceased on the express command of the first consul. This is what had caused this explosion. About the same time, I was called to Napoleon's cabinet. Burien, thanks to his standing with the military ministry of war, had obtained a contract for the supply of military equipment and harness. As his name could not figure in this transaction, it was with the Brothers Coulomb that the contract was made. Burien supplied the funds necessary to the enterprise. A banking firm advanced a sum of 800,000 francs on a mortgage furnished by the Coulombs, but exacted that Monsieur de Burian should be surety for the loan. The brothers Coulomb, having failed shortly after, the bank proceeded against Burian as bondsman. Burian denied all responsibility for the Coulombs' debts, but as the guarantee consisted of private deeds, defeasances, memoranda, and other papers, all in Burian's writing, a lawsuit ensued, which he lost before the lower court, won before the court of appeal, and definitely lost when his adversaries carried it up to the court of cassation. This speculation in which Burian had participated, as described, strongly disgusted Napoleon, who had an invincible repulsion for what is called doing business. The object of the lawsuit and the scandal which resulted therefrom revolted him. He never pardoned his old school fellow and secretary. He spoke to me of him for a long time and often in real pain, which used always to add a bitter complaint against him. It would be distasteful for me to enumerate the various grievances which Napoleon had against Burienne and to repeat the reproaches which he used to make against the man whom I had replaced. The revelations which invariably pour in torrents on a sinking man, revelations many of which were of a very serious nature, increased the displeasure of the first consul. He gave orders to General Duroc to ask Brienne for the keys of the apartment which he had placed at his disposal in the Tuileries, and which he had kept, hoping by a moment's conversation to win back the friendship which he had lost. The first consul refused to see him. He sent him word to return to the National Guard Meuble, the furniture of his apartment, as well as that of his house at Rouillet, before purchasing the house at saint Cloud, which he occupied at the moment of his disgrace. Burien had acquired another house at Rouillet, where he had established himself with his family. He objected that he had thought himself authorized to consider this furniture as a gift, and to keep it as his property. General Duroc took back this answer to the first consul, who replied that his command must be obeyed without any delay, adding irritably that he gave money and not chairs. However, in remembrance of their old friendship and of services rendered, Napoleon gave Brienne the mission to assist each day at the court of Assizes during the trial of the individuals implicated in the George and Moreau plot and to send him a report of each sitting. After the first consul had finished reading these reports, which were handed to him by me, they were deposited at the archives. If they still be there, they might be compared with the accounts of the sittings of the tribunal and of the circumstances of the trial given in the memoirs published under Monsieur de Burian's name. The difference between the thoughts and the language of these two versions could be established. As I have said higher up, I do not think that Burian was the author of the memoirs published under his name. I met him in 1825 in Paris, and he told me that he had been asked to write against the emperor. In spite of all the wrong he did me, he added, I could never make up my mind to do so. My hand would wither rather. 
the ever-growing enfeeblement of his faculties, the state of financial embarrassment to which he found himself reduced, added to the deep resentment with which he remembered his disgrace, rendered him accessible to the pecuniary offers which were afterwards made to him. It is stated the publisher of Burien's memoirs offered him at the time when he had fled to Holstein to escape his creditors, as some said to be 30,000 francs, for his signature to the work. Monsieur de Burienne, already seized with the disease of which he died a few years later in the hospital at Cayenne, consented to allow these memoirs to be published under his name. His entire cooperation in his book consisted in some stray, incomplete notes which were worked out by certain professional writers. These writers, whose names are mentioned, had to make up for the insufficiency of these notes by their own researches and with the help of materials supplied by the publisher. If Monsieur de Burriette had written these memoirs himself, he would not have stated that when he was minister of the emperor to Hamburg, he assisted the agent to the Comte de Lille in drawing up a proclamation in favor of this prince, nor that in 1814 he received the thanks of Louis XVIII. He would not have said that Napoleon had confided to him in 1805 that he had never had any serious intentions of an expedition against England and that the project of a landing, the preparations of which were made with so much noise, was only a trick to amuse fools. Monsieur de Burienne would have spoken neither of his private conversations with Napoleon nor of the alleged confidences which had been made to him, seeing that Napoleon never saw him again after the 20th of October, 1802. When in 1805, the emperor, forgetting his offenses, appointed him plenipotentiary minister to Hamburg, he granted him the usual audience but did not add to this favor any return of his old friendship. He constantly refused, both before and afterwards, either to receive him or to correspond with him. I have had occasion to say elsewhere that during his mission to Hamburg, when special information outside the ministerial correspondence was needed by the emperor, it was I who was charged to ask it of Monsieur de Burienne. Just as I was charged to get similar information from the worthy Monsieur Otto, French ambassador to Munich, the emperor wishing to neglect no means of being informed as to what was going on before and behind the great army. I wanted to say here all that I have to say about Monsieur de Burienne so as not to have to revert to this subject. The first consul ended by resigning himself to his grievances against his old schoolfellow, and if it congratulated himself on having shaken off this yoke, he did, without wishing to make any comparison, what Louis XIV had done on the death of Mazarin. In this connection, he said to me one day, I have abolished the title of confidential secretary. It has too many disadvantages, and I'm forced to admit the fact. I do not wish you to call yourself anything but attache to the first consul. You are young, you have a long career before you, later on we'll see. This title of attache, which was imposed on me by no regulation, was the resume of the reasons which prevented the first consul from according to me the privileges and personal preferences which Burien owed to the length of their relations and the kind of familiarity which had reigned between them. As a matter of fact, routine prevailed. I was constantly being styled secretary to the first consul or emperor, sometimes even confidential secretary. In the course of business, I was constantly writing to the ministers on behalf of the emperor and receiving their replies. It sometimes even happened that he did not sign his letters because just at that moment he might be sitting out on horseback or was prevented by some reason and he would then authorize me to send the letters on accompanied by a letter signed by me. Moderation has always kept me aloof from the encroachments which a more enterprising mind than mine might have been tempted to essay. When, after his work was done, the first consul went to spend an hour in Madame Bonaparte's drawing room, he would bid me take my hat and follow him. I went sometimes. Often, I preferred to employ my rare hours of leisure on my own behalf. Later on, it often happened that I had to remain in his study to expedite some urgent piece of business, and that I had only a few brief moments left to devote to my family and to my friends. 
I ended by contenting myself with the almost obscure position which I occupied in the confidence and familiarity of the consul and emperor without boasting about it or drawing attention to myself. This reserve, by the way, did not at all displease him. Not indeed that he was suspicious, for I never saw any traces of this in his character. He liked to chaff me about my reserve. He used to tell me, which is quite true, that I was totally unknown to several persons amongst his ladies and gentlemen in attendance. As a matter of fact, there were several chamberlains who had heard my name mentioned, but who did not know me by sight. In the notes written in his writing on Fleury de Chaboulon's Memoirs du Règne de Napoleon, Memoirs of the Reign of Napoleon, in 1815, at St. Helena, the emperor says, Meneval and Fang lived in such a retired way that there were chamberlains who, after four years' service in the palace, had never seen them. However, he accorded me his entire confidence and made no change in the custom that his secretary should open all his letters. Before speaking of the labors with which the first consul was occupied at the time of my entry into his service, I should say a word about the men whom he had called to help him in the government of the state. His two colleagues were, as everybody knows, Cambaceres and Lebrun. The former learned lawyer had passed unscathed through the stormiest periods of the revolution thanks to his prudence and his skill. The revolution of the 18th Brumaire had found him Minister of Justice under the directorial government. His reputation for learning and tact had attracted the attention of General Bonaparte. Cambaceres showed himself a skillful politician in all circumstances. He was the faithful counselor of Napoleon who had entire confidence in his judgment and who used to consult him on every point. Little eccentricities of his, which somewhat lent themselves to jesting, by no means diminished the respect in which he was held. The third consul was Le Brown, formerly attached to Chancellor Mao Po. He wrote the speeches and the writings of this magistrate, which at the time of the reform of the parliamentary system in France had rendered their author famous for their nobility of thought and brilliancy of style. A pure and elegant writer, he had consecrated to the cultivation of letters the leisure that business had left him. Financial matters and social economy had equally been the subject of his studies. He had drawn attention to himself in the various assemblies of which he formed part, from the States General to the Council of the Ancients, by his particular knowledge of finance and by his zeal for wise reforms. His knowledge and his fine literary talent promised a useful collaborator to Bonaparte, whilst the sweetness of his character dispelled any fear lest he might prove an unmanageable censor. The choice of these two men proved Bonaparte's tact, and this triumvirate united the best conditions of association that could be desired. The ministry was composed of eight members. I put at the head Talleyrand, who was Minister of Foreign Affairs. He is too well known to need speaking about at any length. His relations with General Bonaparte dated from the Treaty of Campo Formio. His perspicacity had made him see that sooner or later the general superiority would place him at the head of affairs. And provident man that he was. He attached himself to his fortunes. Familiar with the course of business, he had brought to his work real talents, a spirit of intrigue and a high capacity. He was at one and the same time a man of the court and a man of the revolution, and it was to this dualism that he owed the favor of Napoleon. Endowed with a shrewd and conciliating spirit, he had rendered himself agreeable to foreign diplomacy. These qualities rendered him fitter than anybody else to direct foreign affairs and designated him to the choice of first consul. The minister of police was Fouché. The colleagues of the first consul had rejected him, and justly so, because of his immorality and the sanguinary part which he had played during the revolutionary period. 
his knowledge of the plans and the secrets of all the parties to which he was initiated, a mind fruitful in resources, a false air of frankness and independence, the art with which he knew how to persuade that he was the indispensable man, had prevailed over this repugnance, and he was maintained in the post which he had already filled under the directoire. In appearance, he reminded me of Marat, whom I had frequently seen in my early youth. Fouché was taller, very thin. His hair and eyebrows were pale. His eyes were bloodshot, and his complexion was livid. He spoke with a volubility which made one think that he was unburdening the whole of his thoughts. He affected a limitless devotion to the First Consul. It would sometimes happen that he would come to La Malmaison when Napoleon was away. He would then come to me and take me out with him into the park and speak to me at length on the vigilance with which he performed his duties of the intimidation which he practiced on the malcontents of every class of the zeal which devoured him and the help which he would always be ready to give the first consul in whatever he might wish to undertake, invariably finishing with the words, be sure to tell the first consul all I have said.